wonderful to have you with us. Uh, let me pray for you as we, as we open up God's Word together. Lord God, we thank you for your Word, the Bible. We thank you that through it you speak to us, you speak into our hearts and into our minds. May David's words be your words today and uh, may, you, may we leave stronger and more faithful and more enriched than, uh, than we came in. Amen. Thank you. The um, sermon today is based on this passage from Romans and continues on um, from last week. I'd like to just, before we get there, this is not working. Um, it's good to have a look at an overview first. This is kind of an introduction. The, there's another slide I'd like to get to as well. That's it. Now, you've all, most of you have been travelling and you can um, travel various ways. You can travel by air, you can travel by car, you can travel um, by land, by foot. And you have a different experience. So, for instance, if you're travelling by foot, everything's very slow, you get to stop and have a really good solid look. You're in and out of the shops or up and down the mountains or whatever you're doing and you see things very thoroughly. If you're travelling by car, it's a little different because there are um, periods when you're flashing past things and um, you're, not see you're seeing them reasonably but you're not seeing them in the depth that you would if you were um, travelling you know, on foot. Now, then there's travelling by air. Now, I'm assuming you're in an aircraft where you can see outside and it's daytime. When you're travelling by air, you get a different experience because when you're travelling by foot or even by car, while you see the up-close detail, you don't get necessarily an overall picture. Which you, don't, you don't see... the the totality of where you're travelling. So if you're travelling by air, you get to look down and you can see how the landscape changes. You can see where the river actually goes through. You can see the, the, uh, li the outline of the city. Um, you can see whatever it is. You, you get a totally different picture. And those three pictures combine the... If you only are on foot, it, it's difficult to get the overall picture. Now you'll see in, in the bottom corner a letter. When you get a letter from somebody, what you normally do is you start at the beginning and you don't stop until you read the whole thing. That's travelling by air. In other words, when we read the scriptures, when we read a letter, we need to start at the beginning, go right through and get to the end. It gives you the whole picture. Now, when you do that, you're going to miss lots and you're going to see lots of things that will raise questions. You want to go back and have a look at things in great depth. But what it's done is it's given you an overall picture. There's a need also to um, travel like hard. There's a need to kind of look at big sections um, and then kind of stop and have a look at bits within it. And there's also a need to look at particular verses sometimes, which is travelling by foot, and delve really deep, deeply into them. What's behind the verse? What's behind the word? And these three different ways form a whole. And so when we look at Romans, we really need to do all three. And so I encourage you to go home or sometime this week Pick up Romans and read it in one go. There'll be a lot that um, you won't pick up as you read through, depending how many times you've read it already, um, but you'll gain something that you haven't gained before. So having said that, go back one. If I can get this to work. Maybe Noah can help me. Thank you. Now, Paul has a pattern in his writings. 
it's not there every time he writes, but generally the pattern is that the first bit is welcome and in, in welcome, greetings, and then he hits the theme, the theme of the letter. And so in Romans, verses 1 to 17 is that. And um, I think the theme, theme is summarised in verses 16 to 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. And it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. So then Paul begins to then give the theological foundation for what he's saying. And so in, in chapters 1, um, going, Adele was saying last week, theological 1 to 5, you've got Paul laying out the, the fact that we can't justify ourselves, but Christ on the cross takes away our sins, and that we receive by faith. And that's consistent with the Old Testament because that's exactly what happened with Abraham. And so Paul, this is 1 to 5. And then the theological foundations continue right through until probably the end of chapter 11. Now, there, and then 11, 12 onward, it's very much the practical stuff. Now, um, in chapter 6, and this is where we come to today's reading, chapter 6, Paul comes to an objection to his gospel. And the objection is, if God is so forgiving and loving, and it's all a gift by faith, then why not just keep sinning? And then God's grace would be seen even more. And um, Paul answers that and says, it's ridiculous. If you've turned to Christ, you've turned your back on sin, and you've turned to Christ to live the right way. Christ died to sin, he lives for God. We do the same. Now, we're probably not troubled by that particular thing in our generation, but we are troubled by the fact that Christians can tend to take the grace of God lightly. That, you know, God is forgiving, forgetting, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, um, we, we, don't, we take it lightly. And that's more of the current thing with chapter 6 for us. In chapter 7, um, what happens then is that um, he moves on from there and it says, I would like to be better than I am. The good I would like to do, I don't do. And the bad I'd rather not do, I do. Who will rescue me? Chapter 6 answers the question. Christ does focus on the spirit and not the flesh or the law. Focus on the spirit and you will live by the power of the spirit. Now, this is very much the same as... That's the gospel one. I'm not... I'm just getting... First time I've used PowerPoints with this. Sorry. Um, can't read it from here. Um, <laughs> I think that's... We've covered that, I think. Yep. Okay, John. <clears throat> it's very much the same as John's gospel. Because after, in John's gospel, <clears throat> when um, the... Nicodemus comes, we see you from God. Jesus says, you can't see you from God unless you're born again. Nicodemus, <clears throat> how can that happen? It's, you're born through the Holy Spirit, you're born again. The Holy Spirit comes and you're born again. And then it's, um, for God so loved the world. But then it moves on to, and this is how the judgment works. That we move into the light as Christians whereas the people who refuse to believe stay in the dark. Because, and moving into the light is that Christ is the light of the world. And so it is, our focus is Christ. We move into the light. We're not afraid to have the dark. We're not afraid to have the light shine on us and show us where we need to grow. We move into the light. Our focus is on Christ. And Paul is saying the same thing in Romans 6. Um, in, and in the beginning of chapter 8 of, sorry, ch chapter 8, so beginning 
uh, verses of chapter 8. Focus on the Spirit and set your minds on the Spirit, is what Paul will say there. Now that then brings us to where Adele was last week. So skipping that, that brings us to <coughs> today's readings. And the, I think in today's readings, what Paul does is he begins to address the realities of being a disciple of Christ and the opposite of chapter 6, where chapter 6 was the easy way. You know, this is the hard way. And if you think of, and, and that Jesus says, pick up your cross, there is, a difficult, there, is, there is the hard thing of being a faithful Christian and in, um, so he addresses these difficult things. This is, and a Christian, Paul is saying, in, I believe in these verses, he's showing the encouragement that you can keep focus on the spirit despite what happens because of what God is doing. Now, if you go back to the parable of the sower, Four grounds. The first ground, the, so the, the, the gospel doesn't take root. Ground two, shallow ground, stony, persecution kills it. Ground three, weedy, the cares of the world and um, problems, worries, choke it. Ground four, good ground. Now, so in a sense, Paul begins... Um, by helping people, I think, focus. If you, to, when you're following Christ, this is how you don't end up being grounds one, grounds two and three. And um, he goes on, and he says, "This is where we get to today's readings." After all. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we ought. But I'm not used to using PowerPoint, so I forget. Again, please. Again. Shows you I'm, the, I'm not used to using PowerPoints. Um, should be on to... The beginning of the, the um, verses 26, 27, please know. Okay. That's one before that? No, okay. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what the mind of the, what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God so here paul is saying to the to christians seeking to follow christ god knows god knows everything that's affecting you everything you're going through every opposition every doubt it doesn't matter, he knows it, and he's on to it. And the Spirit is interceding, the Spirit is praying for you, not just as we might pray with a guess, but the Spirit prays perfectly. He knows the will of the Father. He prays in accordance with the will of the Father. We are being prayed for by God himself, or the Spirit himself. And this is his first not his first, first in today's, Adele's was last week, his first, in today's reading, his first encouragement that we are not alone in this. Whatever you're going through, whether it's in your family or occupation or being a Christian in witnessing or um, outside forces or health, whatever it is, God is there, God understands, and God is praying for us. And then it moves on to verses 28 to 30, please know. 
And here it says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, in these readings, um, it says God is working for good for those who love him. That's the qualification for those who love him. Now, it's not, not that God isn't working for good for others, but in this context, it's in, it's in the context of um, that God is doing one step A, step B, step C, step D, and it's for those who love him. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means if we don't love God, if we walk into the darkness rather than walking into the light, it's difficult for God to help us. I mean, that's practical common sense. It's the same with any circumstance. That if we refuse to listen to God, if we take our own way, then it's harder for God to help us. Um, he's wanting to help us always, wanting to help all. But we have to listen, we have to obey. That's what it is. It's to walk with the Spirit. It's to keep the mind focused on the Spirit, follow Christ. That's the qualification for these things to be true in this ver these verses. Then the question is, well, what does it mean to love God? Can we move to the next verses, please, Noah? Okay. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, Jesus speaks to the crowd, and he speaks in, in Matthew's gospel, but he speaks to the disciples. And he's saying, this is what it means to be blessed. You're blessed if you're like that. Well, let's look at what they mean in, in very brief time. Poor in spirit. Those who don't think they're absolutely fantastic, have nothing to learn, um, uh, and that they've got it all under control. The poor in the spirit person is somebody who realises their um, poorness of spirit. They haven't got it all under control. They aren't the greatest thing this earth has ever seen. This person is open to God. This person is open to help. This person is open to learning. And so God will say, Jesus says, blessed are you if you're like that. If you're like that, blessed are you. Blessed are those who mourn for they'll be comforted. I don't think this is about death. It's not to say that we're not comforted in death. I think it's about sin. In other words, blessed are those who mourn over their sin. Blessed are those who realise when, when we feel short, when we feel, I wish it wasn't like that. But we mourn over it. I don't mean to become grovelling, introspective wrecks. That doesn't help anybody and that's not what God wants. But there's the but there's a desire that mourns over our failings. I want to change. I want to grow. And so, and, and mourn over the world, mourn over the fact that this is wrong in the world and it should change and maybe I can do something. And so he's saying, blessed are those who mourn. For God will use them. And then I'm going to skip three and then explain um, five. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they'll be filled. Righteousness, that we would be living rightly as people. We'd have a right relationship with God, a right relationship with others. 
And William Barclay in his commentary says the word that's used for hunger and thirst here is not, I'm peckish, what's in the fridge? Oh, this tub of yogurt will do. That's not the hunger he's talking about. He said the word that's used for hunger here is I am starving. If I don't get food soon, I will not live. And um, he also said that, that it's a hunger not for a little bit, but for the lot. I want the whole loaf of bread. And so in a sense, Jesus is saying here, blessed are you if you hunger and thirst to be right with God and right with others. Blessed are you if within your heart and your mind you really would like to be like that. So here is a picture of people who love God. It's not a picture of people who can say, I've never failed God. I have never made a mistake. That's, that's not the picture. That's not the love it's talking about. This is the love which says, I want God. I want to learn to follow him. I want to learn to be obedient to him. I want to learn to serve him. I want to learn to love others as I should. That's what he means in this passage, I believe, by saying those who love God because they're the ones who are going to be open to God guiding and directing and using their circumstances. And so then he goes on and he talks about... Um, he talked about those who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be called, to be formed the image of his son, in order that they might be the firstborn within a large family. And those he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he justified, and those whom he justified, he glorified. In other words, there's a progression. Paul is saying, this is what God's done with you. He's predestined you, he's called you. Having called you, he's, set, he's justified you with himself. You can put right with God through Christ. You have peace with him. And then he goes on and he says, and he's glorified you. Now, it's not he will glorify you, as in heaven, which is true, but this is past tense. He has glorified you. And um, so he, this is progression that Paul is pointing out to, to the people he's writing to and to us, that this is God's progression, this is God's purpose, this is what God does. He's got a plan in our lives. Now, Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 3, and all of us with unveiled faces seeing the glory of God as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into the same image, that's the image of Christ, from one degree of glory to another well, this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Which, as Christ forms his image in us, the glory of God is shown in us. It is in that sense that Paul is saying, past tense, we have been glorified. This is what God is doing. He's glorified you this far. He will glorify you further. And he's saying to the people he's writing to, in your setting your mind on the Spirit, as you face all these things, this is God's purpose and God can use any circumstance that we hit. But whatever you're hit by, whatever circumstances, whatever things in life hit you, God in those circumstances can work for good with those who love him. It doesn't mean the circumstances are good. And it doesn't mean we're going to see it instantly, as in, this is, wow, marvellous deliverance prayer, bang, it's all solved. It happens like that sometimes. But sometimes it is the character growing in things, which are of a different form. And, and so he is saying, this is what God's doing. There's a purpose in there. He can use anything that happens to you as you, as you love him, to bring good as you go through all these difficulties. And then, 
and now if we could move on to the next so it's verses 32 31 to 32 sorry. and then he then says the next thing well sometimes as Christians um, we don't feel, too, don't feel too good about ourselves and sometimes as Christians have had a go at us and it's possible for a Christian to think Um, I um, don't know that I can ask. I don't know that I'm worthy to ask this. And Paul is saying, you know, if God is for us, who can be against us? Everybody else doesn't count. He, he didn't withhold his own son. So if he did that for us, won't he give us everything else? Won't he give us whatever we need? And again, we may not exactly know the way that God's going to answer that, but he'll give us everything we need. We, we needn't doubt because of what he did in Jesus. He's got to give us the other things. And then verses 33, 34, please now. Then what about when we when we put ourselves down or where other people put us down and we feel um, unworthy and we're tempted to think, you know, what, what does God think of us? And so Paul says, well, who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, to, who intercedes for us. It was that, that no matter what happens, no matter where we fail, the biggest things happen. Christ has been forgiven. And th there is, we are, Christ is interceding for us. Don't put yourself outside God's spectre of forgiveness. There's an analogy I use sometimes which makes sense to me, I don't know if it makes sense to you. Think of a table and on the middle of the table is something, cup, bars, whatever. And the middle of the table would represent being in perfect unity with Christ. The table is the grace of God. And um, we're probably never in the middle exactly, but if we if we um, fail in some way, think of the cup moving towards the edge. It's still on the table. It's still in the grace of God, and but we're feeling the distance. We're feeling the distance, and so we. Ask forgiveness. And the distance closes and the cup's back where it was. Hopefully a bit closer to the centre. And it's like that in, in relationship with human beings, isn't it? That there are relationships where the relationship is never going to break, but for a moment we've had an argument or we've done something and, and the peace isn't there. And then we say, I'm sorry, I apologise. And the other one throws their arms around us and says, I love you. And bang, we're back. The, re the relationship was never broken. It was never undone. It was always there. But for a moment, the peace had gone until we said, I'm sorry. And Paul is saying, it's like that with God. And then um, 35 to 39, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we've been killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I'm convinced neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Doubt I can face this. Doubt I can overcome. Are there spiritual forces against me? And Paul is saying, doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what it is. In everything, we are more than conquerors through God's grace. And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Some of you will know the book um, by Corrie Ten Boom. Um, talked about being a prisoner of war camp in the, in the Germans, World War II. Um, in it, she has a story at the beginning. She's a, a young woman. And she says to her father, I don't know if I would have the strength if certain things happened. And the father said to her, tell me, when you were younger, and I'd send it to your, I forget, my grandma's, um, when did I give you the ticket? Did I give it to you a long time before? She said, no, you gave it to me when I got on the train. So with God, he said, when the time comes, he'll be there. So, these things Paul is saying to the people who set their minds on Christ, to people who set their minds on the Spirit, who feel the cross, who are seeking to love, who are seeking to grow. He's saying, these things may hit you, but in everything God is there with you. So no, nothing will separate you from him, ever. The last slide, please. I think it's the last slide. Therefore, he says, you are more than conquerors. Amen. those very powerful words from Romans we come to our time of prayer